This is the ninth in a series of lessons on an overview of the Holy Bible. Let me begin this lesson by sharing with you some of the books which I use in my own personal study. First of all, let me show you Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. This is a book that I strongly recommend for everyone to have. It has literally every word in the authorized version of the English Bible, every V, every A, every N. I also have Young's Analytical Concordance of the Bible because it enables me to do some special things which Strong's does not. I'm not a very good Greek student. Therefore, instead of using a Greek Testament, I have several of them. I have an interlinear Greek Testament that I prefer to use. It has the English translation and then right below that the Greek words so that I can compare one with the other. Because I do not consider myself a good Greek student, I have an analytical Greek lexicon which gives me the conjunctions and declensions of every word in the Greek Testament in alphabetical order. Then I have a Thayer's Greek English or uh, Greek English lexicon. Art and Gingrich is supposed to be better, but I have never purchased one of those. Uh, an invaluable tool for me is Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. This particular one, as you can see, is well worn. I have another one at home, and I also have Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, which was just given to me as a gift, and I haven't really gotten to use it very much. This next set of books is very expensive. It's the Dictionary of New Testament Theology in three volumes. It's uh, a much more technical and detailed study of words. This particular volume costs $27.95. Volume 3 costs $37.95. Then for Hebrew studies, I have uh, these theological workbooks of the Old Testament, which are not nearly as technical as you can purchase, but it happens to be all that I have at the present time. Now, only 6% of the world's people live in the United States of America, and only 9% of the world's people speak and read the English language. The vast majority of the people in the world are illiterate. Many of them do not he even have a written language. I have here a little cassette player which I understand is being used in the mountains of Asia. Uh, among the illiterate people there, uh, Jesse Yongmi has recorded the New Testament in a tribal language. I want to play you just a little bit. I have no idea what it is saying. Now, among the Lisu tribal people, who are privileged enough to have one of these cassette players, they have absolutely no way, no way of gleaning anything technical from the scriptures, none whatsoever. Most of the people who are privileged enough to play one of these cassettes will never have opportunity to have concordances and lexicons and dictionaries and commentaries like those of us who read and speak the English language. Therefore, I must emphasize again that the essence of Christianity is not something technical. Now, where do we get the idea that it was? It comes, I think, from a misunderstanding of the law. The law was a period which lasted approximately 1,500 years, and we show you here on the blackboard that the first age of mankind is called the age of the patriarchs. The word patriarch means father, and in the patriarchal age, there were no kings except the fathers. For example, Noah was like a king in his family, or Abraham was like a king in his family. They did whatever they wanted to do because they were like kings. They were also like priests. Uh, Abram built an altar and made sacrifices. Noah built an altar and made sacrifices. Job built an altar and made sacrifices. There were no priests in the age of the patriarchs except the fathers. They were also like prophets. So when God wanted to speak to mankind in the age of the patriarchs, he spoke to men like Noah or men like Job or men like Abram because they were the prophets, priests, and kings of the patriarchal age. Beginning approximately 1,500 years before Jesus was born, we have the age of Moses, the Mosaic dispensation. And then we have the age of Christ. 
Now, of the thousands of years of human history, the 15 years of Mosaic law was only a relatively small part. And yet, unfortunately, we get our view of God from the law. The 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews says that the law was a shadow and not reality. I dare say you could study my shadow or I could study your shadow for a lifetime and never really understand your nature or temperament. Thus, the students of the law who memorized the jots and tittles of Mosaic law never recognized Jesus, and he was the substance which cast that shadow. And those who are merely students of the law who do not see the Bible as a whole come up with some real perversions and distortions about God. For example, in the period of law, we find that Moses was kept out of Canaan because of a technicality. In the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, God commanded him to speak to a rock and it would give water. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it. Now, that seems like a very technical thing to us, but God kept Moses out of Canaan. And several times, as you read in the Old Testament scriptures, this is specifically stated to be the reason why Moses was not permitted to enter into the land of Canaan. When the Mosaic priesthood began... Aaron was, of course, the high priest, and he had four sons. Uh, and we read in the 10th chapter of the book of Leviticus that the two oldest boys died because they offered strange fire before the Lord, which the Lord had commanded them not. Their names were Nadab and Abihu. Again, we assume, well, God must be technical because he killed these boys for offering strange fire before the Lord. We also read in the period of law that the men of Beth Shemesh looked into the ark. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 19, according to the King James Version, says that 50,000, threescore, and ten men of Beth Shemesh died because they looked into the ark of the covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we read about a man named Uzzah. The ark was being transported on an ox cart. Now, it was not supposed to be transported that way. It was supposed to be carried by duly sanctified members of the tribe of Levi. But these men had erred. They'd made a mistake. They put the ark of God up on an ox cart. When it came to Nacon's threshing floor, the oxen stumbled, and as the ark was about to fall, Uzzah stretched forth his hand and touched the ark of the covenant. And when he did, it, it angered the Lord, and the man died. So students of the law conclude God must be technical Otherwise, we would not have all of these technical stories dealing with death because men violated some technical point. But I have to remind you now that the tribal people of Asia have no way of being technical. And the law was not intended to make men technical. The law was not given to reflect the nature of God. The law was only a shadow. You don't understand the nature of God from studying a shadow. You understand the nature of God from studying Jesus. There are no shadows in him. He is the light of the world, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, today's lesson is going to be on faith. We have tried to show you that there is an overview of the Bible that deals with love. Jesus said that to love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, comprise the teaching of the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We've shown you from the, that from the very first of human history in the Garden of Eden, God was trying to teach us to love. And when the last books of Scripture were written, John the beloved apostle said, this is the message that we've heard from the beginning, that you ought to love one another and not be like Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's were righteous. Today's lesson is going to be on the subject of faith. And we want to show you that faith is also a message which was taught universally in every age of mankind. As a matter of fact, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which is known as the faith chapter of the Bible, we read in verse 4 that by faith, Abel, now that was the son of Adam and Eve, right in the beginning of human history. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. 
He was the first person on the face of this earth to ever experience physical death. We don't know very much about him, but he still speaks. Even in a world of earth satellites and rocket ships and interplanetary travel, righteous Abel still speaks. And he does so, the scriptures say, by means of faith. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, the scriptures teach that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might understand and be justified by this transcendent principle of faith. So the principle of faith transcends legal considerations. For example, Abel was the younger brother of Cain. The older brother had certain legal rights, but that didn't matter when it was compared with faith. So by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Also in the age of the patriarchs, we read about a man named Abram. The name Abram means exalted father, and his name was changed to Abraham, which means the father of multitudes. Because one night, Abram went out, and he stared at the stars of the heavens, and God made him a promise. And he said, Abram, you see those stars? I'm going to give you that many children just like the stars of the heaven and the sand by the seashore for multitudes. And the Bible says, Abram believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, Abram was not a righteous man. The things that he did defy our imagination. For example, when he went down into Egypt one time, he turned his wife over to a man whom he thought was a pagan man who didn't fear God so that the Pharaoh of Egypt could do to her whatever he wanted to do. That was not righteous. Abram was not a righteous man. The Bible never says he was a righteous man. But it says that his faith caused God to impute righteousness unto him. In a very real sense, there is none righteous. No, not one. Now, Abram had two sons initially, and then later six sons by a woman named Keturah. But the firstborn son was named Ishmael, whom he had by a slave girl named Hagar. Later, when the law of Moses would be written, it would be specifically forbidden that a man discriminate against a woman's son simply because she was considered an inferior wife. That's in the 21st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. But uh, Ishmael, even though he had all the legal rights of the firstborn, did not, in fact, become the firstborn because Abram had another son, and his name was Isaac. That name means laughter. Now, Isaac's mother was beyond the age of bearing when Isaac was conceived. And so it was a miracle that he was born. The Bible says, By faith Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed when she was past the age of bearing. And by faith also Abram considered not his own body now dead, though he was a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So faith enabled Isaac to take precedence over his older brother Ishmael. Now Isaac had two sons. Their names were Jacob and Esau. Literally speaking, Esau was the firstborn, but in Exodus 4.22, the scriptures called Jacob the firstborn. His name was changed to Israel. The Lord said, Have I not chosen Israel, my firstborn? There are transcendent principles which uh, are greater than law. For example, every time we drop something here on earth, if I were to drop this, it would fall. You say, that's an inexorable law. You can't get away from that. But you can. We know today that if an astronaut in orbit would drop an object like this, it would not fall. It would float. And by faith, we somehow miraculously transcend the physical world around us and become citizens of heaven. Jacob had 12 sons. God did not choose the firstborn, who was Reuben, or the firstborn by his favorite wife, which was Joseph, but instead, in his sovereignty, he chose Judah and said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Judah had three sons. The first was named Ur, the second was named Onan, and the third was named Shelah. The first two boys married the same woman, and both of them died. According to law, the father was then to give the next brother unto her that that brother might raise up seed in the name of his deceased brethren. But Judah elected not to do that. 
So sometime later, Tamar seduced him. Now, Judah didn't know who it was, and he fathered twins by her. And when these twins were being born, the midwife identified the firstborn by tying a scarlet thread about his hand and said, this came out first. The legal definition of firstborn was that which first openeth the womb. So the little boy was named Zerah, which means dawn. But in the process of being born, the younger brother came out first, Pharaoh's. So every time we read about the genealogy of Jesus, it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to Pharaoh's. That's not the most legal way to do it, but faith has a way of transcending legal considerations. Don't you remember when Joseph stood before the old dying Jacob with his two sons? He put the younger son on Jacob's left hand and the older son on Jacob's right hand and said, Now bless these boys, my father. And Jacob reached out his hands and crossed them. Truly, the Lord seeth not as man seeth. We look only on the outward appearance. We think only as physical human beings. But we have a transcendent God, and the power of God by faith transcends all legal considerations. And the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us unto this principle. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 3 and verse 19 says, the law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might become guilty before God. There is no way that a devout Jew could by law be sinless. Now let me give you a few examples. In the fifth chapter of the book of Leviticus, the Bible teaches that a person becomes unclean when he touches something unclean, whether you know about it or not. For example, I was just sitting in this chair. If a menstruous woman had touched that chair, the chair would become unclean and I would become unclean by my association with it. The 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus teaches that a snail is an unclean object. If I should touch a dead snail, I become unclean whether I am aware of it or not. So you can understand why the Jewish people said, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle, because you never know but what that person you might touch, that doorknob you might touch, that chair you might touch might be unclean and therefore contaminate you. So let's suppose that I'm a devout Jew and today I am going to be pure by means of law. Therefore, I fumigate the room where I'm staying so that there will be no insects there to contaminate me. I do not leave the room. I lock the door so that I will not be contaminated by touching or contacting an unclean person. And I stand at attention with the law of God before me and for a period of 24 hours I read that law over and over and over only to discover that I am still guilty and unclean, not because of anything which I did personally, but according to the fourth chapter of the book of Leviticus and verse 3, the scriptures teach that the high priest could sin in such a way that it would bring guilt upon all the people. Don't you remember when Achan stole the wedge of gold and the Babylonian garments? He sinned and a whole nation suffered. The whole nation suffered because David counted Israel. And that's the way the law was designed. The law was not designed to save people. The law was designed to drive us in desperation to the transcendent principle of faith. Well, what is faith? The 11th chapter of Hebrews begins by saying, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. To say that faith is substance sounds like nonsense. We say, that is substance. You can weigh this, you can paint it, you can package it. That is substance. Faith is ethereal. That's not substance. But the Bible reverses all of this and teaches that the things which we see are only temporal. This mechanical device has a limited lifespan. It is only temporal. The things that you see are temporal. It is the things that you do not see which are eternal. So the word translated as uh, substance is the Greek word hypostasis, which means that which stands under and is foundational. So the Bible was trying by means of law to drive us to the transcendent principle of causing something to happen in your mind which would cause you to believe. 
Someone said it only takes a billionth of a volt to change your mind. And if you ever expect to be right with God, you must believe that God is, and you must believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I read a book uh, some years ago by Bob Richards. It was called The Heart of a Champion. And in this book, he gives story after story of individuals who became Olympic champions, but who did not have a physical body that you would think would cause them to be champions. Glenn Cunningham, for example, was so badly burned in a schoolhouse fire that the doctors didn't think he would ever walk again. He became one of the greatest runners in the world. Johnny Fulton was run over by a car at the age of three. His hips were crushed, his ribs were broken, his skull was fractured, he suffered compound fractures of the leg. No one thought he would live, but he became a champion, running the half mile in 149.5. Walt Davis became an Olympic high jumper in 1952, but at the age of nine, he was totally paralyzed by polio. Shelley Mann was paralyzed by polio at the age of five, but she overcame that handicap to win eight different swimming records for America and to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games in Melbourne, Australia. Howard Conley won the Olympic hammer throw despite a crippled left arm which had been bro broken 13 times. Babe Didrikson Zaharias, perhaps the greatest woman athlete of all time, was so poor she couldn't afford to go to the gymnasium like other athletes. She trained for the hurdles by jumping shrubbery in the backyard. Bob Mathias broke the Olympic decathlon record despite the handicap of a pulled muscle. The pist pistol shooting champion of the 1952 Olympics lost his right arm six months after winning his gold medal. He continued to train, however, for the next three and one, one half years with his left arm and came back three and one half years later to win his second gold medal. Tinley Albright had crippled legs and the experts predicted she would never use them again. She went on to become the world's figure skating champion. Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile for the first time in human history on a rain soaked track that had been raining for five hours. The weather was too cold, the wind was too strong, but he did the impossible because of something that happened in his mind. He had a coach put his arm around his shoulder and say, Roger, I believe you are going to be the first man to break the four minute mile. And what he believed literally transformed his life. What you believe has a very definite association with what you are going to achieve. It is said that Neil Armstrong at the age of five told his friends, I'm going to be the first man to ever walk on the moon. Neil Armstrong was. But faith without works is dead. What he believed had to be coupled with his actions. So when Neil Armstrong sat down to eat, no doubt he ate differently than other kids his age because of something he believed. He believed he was going to be the first man to walk on the moon. Therefore, he had to have a strong body. When he did his schoolwork, perhaps he did it more diligently than other students because of something which he believed. He believed he was going to be the first man to ever walk on the moon. Therefore, he had to study harder than others did. So the Bible says, faith without works is dead, being alone. The Bible also talks about believing in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 says that you can be saved by faith and the gospel unless you believe in vain. Now, the principle of faith can help you to sell insurance policies. The principle of faith can help you to make millions of dollars. Napoleon Hill wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich and said that anything which the mind of man can conceive and believe, he also can achieve. But if all you do with the principle of faith is make millions of dollars, you have, in a sense, believed in vain. The principle of faith, which from the beginning to the end of, of the Holy Bible, is to teach you that you can, by the grace of God, be forgiven of your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, which was spilled at Calvary over 1,900 years ago, is effectual to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. In September of 1865, Jules Verne, who's been called the father of science fiction, wrote a book called De la Terre a la Lune. Those are French words which mean from the earth to the moon. In this fictitious novel, he talked about a spaceship blasting off of all places from Florida. 
You have to remember in 1865, that was 18 years before the automobile. That was 38 years before the maiden flight at Kitty Hawk with Orville and Wilbur Wright. And it was 104 years before Neil Armstrong blasted off for the moon in his Apollo moon craft. Now, uh, you'd think that uh, Jules Verne would have the space shift blast off from Europe, but no. From the savage New World, and of all places in the New World, from the swampy peninsula called Florida. In his fictitious novel, it was essentially the same size and weight as the Apollo moon craft would be 104 years later. And of all things, he had it splashed down in the Pacific Ocean when it returned from the moon, and 104 years later, that was just two and one-half miles from the actual splashdown of the Apollo moon craft. Who would believe that in 1865? Not any real intelligent people, no scientists, just maybe little kids. And Jesus says to you, if you really want to be converted, you must be like a little child in order to do it. Does that sound foolish to you? I thank God for fools, for men who dare to dream beyond the lean horizons of their days, men not too timid to pursue a gleam to unguessed lands of wonder and amaze. Thank God for fools abused of low estate. We rear our temples on the stones they laid, and ours is the prize their tired soul might not wait. Thank God for fools. The trails that ring the world are dark with blood and sweat where they have passed. And they are the flags of every flag unfurled, their ashes and oblivion at last. May you today, by the power of his holy word, become a fool for Christ and believe that God can save you from your sins. Thank you.